Hi, I'm Ushma Neal with the Journal of Clinical Investigation, and I thank you for joining us for the next in our series of conversations with giants in medicine. I'm delighted to be in North Carolina today to speak with Dr. Oliver Smithies. Smithies of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, is best known for pioneering the techniques required for introducing DNA into cells. His work with gene targeting revolutionized the biomedical research field and allowed for the creation of both knockout and transgenic mice. Smithy's lab itself created the first models of cystic fibrosis, and his further work has gone on to identify many of the genetic factors involved in atherosclerosis, heart disease, and many others, especially hypertension. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about you today, especially as your work was partly noted to share in the 2007 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So I'm delighted to get a chance to hear a little bit more about your life. Can you start by telling me a little bit about your parents and where you were brought up and what you were like as a child? Uh, I, I was born in, a, in Halifax, uh, Yorkshire, in the north of England. Uh, we lived at, in a village, though, not in Halifax. We lived in a village called Copley, and it was quite a small village. The total population was only 1,500, and uh, we lived uh, on a, 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 I think it was a town, um, probably a, a, a townhouse. I mean, it was owned, not owned by us. We, we rented and we lived at a house about, oh, 15 minutes walk from school. I used to walk to school there and uh, to Copley School. And um, uh, with my twin brother, most of the time, I had a twin brother age, the same age of me, of course, <laughs> uh, but he was four hours younger than me. So I, I, I always uh, let him know that. Um, and um, my father was, uh, at that point in his life, he was an insurance salesman. And he used to sell insurance for the Canadian uh, Life Assurance Company, I think it was called, um, uh, and to farmers and small business people around. And my mother was uh, a teacher in the uh, technical college. Uh, she had a degree and uh, taught English literature and uh, English just English in, in general, and so uh, they gave me, uh, I, I think, two sorts of things. Uh, my father was very good with his hands, and we always had an old car that was being repaired, constantly breaking down. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were one of the few people in the village to have a car, but it was still pretty poor car. And uh, so I learned from him a lot about um, helping with hands and doing things with hands. And my mother, of course, loved the English literature, so we we would hear, she would often read to us, uh, because my father would go out for uh, for his on his job, and he would often be late for midday meal, which was the main meal of the day in that part of England. Uh, the, the, it wasn't lunch; it was dinner, uh, though it was at noon. And if he was late, my mother would read to us, and so we would often hope my father would be late, <laughs> because she was a very good reader. Now that you grew up both tinkering and with a love of the words, but were you into sports at all? Uh, well, I was uh, uh, tinkering, yes. Uh, but sports, I was in a sense unlucky because at age seven I got rheumatic fever, um, streptococcal infection, I guess, of, uh, of the heart valve, the mitral valve. And uh, in those days people didn't know what to do very much and uh, there weren't an antibiotics. And um, so I was just uh, put in bed for 10 weeks as a child at age seven. And then afterwards, uh, no sports. So I wasn't allowed to play sports. And uh, uh, I've, I've thought of that as, in a, in a way, two things. You could say it was a handicap, but I could say it was a benefit because it made me do other things, read and enjoy. And I always am grateful to my schoolmates because when I went to high school, which is called a grammar school in England at that time, um, uh, I couldn't play sports, and I, I was always top of the class, and and I never was teased, and I always think that's rather marvelous that uh, people could accept the fact this kid who's who seems to get to the top of the class without working and uh, and doesn't play any sports and uh, typical subject for bullying. 
but no, there wasn't any bullying and I never was feel, felt bad about it. But for that reason I didn't play sports until I was 14 and who can play ball at four, who can learn to play ball at 14? So instead you spent your time making radio controlled boats oh, and this sort, yes, loudspeakers and yes, things. That's right. mm -hmm. And so did that led to you pursuing um, an interest in the physical sciences, physics and chemistry? Well, I, I, su I, I suppose I'm, I've always thought that I already knew that I wanted to be a scientist quite early in life, although I didn't know the word. Uh, I knew the word inventor and the, I, sometime around, maybe reading while I was sick there, um, I, I read a comic on, on an inventor and I thought, All right, that's what I want to be, I want to be an inventor. Well, that really was what I became, a scientist inventor, if you like. Um, and yet you landed at Oxford for, to well, read for I, well, medical school. I had very good, had good teachers and uh, in, in, uh, in the high school, in the grammar school, the, the chemistry teacher was a very earnest and staid person, uh, A.D. Phoenix, and uh, the math teacher was an awful man. <laughs> No, nobody liked him. I didn't like him. He, he couldn't keep discipline, but he loved mathematics, and he 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 taught me calculus in a way that made it it was magical with this this way of thinking. And in fact, I never did any more mathematics or the rest of my career. I I probably should have, but never did. Um, but uh, so I um, then when it came to the time to. Uh, called the sixth form in, in uh, English um, academic uh, schooling. Uh, you, you took a, an advanced, uh, um, uh, not degree, an advanced certificate, if you like, and and then you would spend some time, if, if you chose to, uh, going on to apply for scholarships, and you could study by yourself and. Uh, because at that point you would be maybe the only student left and uh, and then apply to, for the university and and I got my scholarship uh, to Oxford the Balliol College I think because uh, I was good at physics and maths and um, and I thought I was going to be a physicist but for a reason that I don't even remember why I, I decided instead to go into medicine and and did a couple of years of anatomy and physiology and and the third year to get a, an honours degree in physiology but in that third year I got exposed to a new discipline uh, which at that time didn't have a name but we would now call molecular biology uh, with uh, my tutor Sandy Ogston and uh, this was a marvellous field but I thought I can't really do a good job in this if I don't know chemistry so then I took a second degree of chemistry and that was very fortunate, I think, because it meant that I had two, skills, two background knowledge in animal and physiological things and in uh, and medical things to some degree and um, in chemistry and so I was never frightened of either of them and my work mainly has used the, the combination of these two things in the rest of my career. Mm -hmm. So now you invoke the names of your math teacher and your chemistry teacher and Sandy Ogston. So yeah. you've, in many of the things that you've written, you've always paid great tribute to the people that taught you, yes, especially Sandy Ogston. Yes. So what do you think he taught you the most? Was or, it how to learn, how to analyze, how to ask a question? No, I think he taught me uh, always to look uh, as uh, possible at basic principles of things, to try to not think all about the little little details, you might say, but the fundamental things. Uh, so he would uh, he was a chemist, of course, and he liked he liked thermodynamics, which is the um, energy balance, you might say. And so he said, always, does it make uh, does it make sense chemically? Does it make is it is it commonsensical? You might say, because if it doesn't make common sense, it's not likely to make any other sort of sense. <laughs> and t taught you to look at things uh, in a in a critical way. Uh, 
and, and the, his whole approach of, of using molecular methods to study biology was completely new at that time and very exciting and, and I just, uh, he was a captivating person. But you know, he said one thing, he said, I liked teaching my bright students, of course, he said, but I got more enjoyment out of teaching my not so bright students. He said, because then I would explain things to them and I would get this response. Ah, now I understand. And that response from a student was to him very important. So he cared about his students, not just about science. Was it during this era that the term NBG Bokfo was invented? It, it was, yes. It, it was Jean Stanier, uh, who was a, a gra graduate student at the same time as I was. She was a student of Somerville College, uh, Oxford. At that time, it, the, uh, the w women's colleges and the men's colleges were separated. There wasn't uh, any, uh, uh, whatever it is, you know, mixing, I can't get the word out, <laughs> cool. Whatever it is. Co-ed. Co-ed, yes, right. There weren't any co-ed colleges and um, uh, she was a graduate student at the same time and she, she got into the habit of putting this label NBG BOKFO around, NBG BOKFO. Uh, on stuff that was lying around and it stood for no bloody good but okay for Oliver because I would always use junk uh, for making things that I m needed to make. At what point in your training did you then decide I'm going to go to America to further my studies? Well, uh, that that was at the end of my uh, PhD, of course, uh, when you were going, well, it was a DPhil in Oxford, Doctor of Philosophy, and, um, uh, and Sandy Ogden uh, suggested it would be a good idea if I went to, went to the States uh, for a postdoc, and, and I wasn't very keen. I said, oh, I don't like America. And, uh, <laughs> And he said, well, you, that's a silly remark, all the more reason you should go. And there was a, another uh, graduate student, a visiting Rhodes Scholar from the University of Wisconsin, uh, was uh, at the lab at the, at the same time. And uh, he said, uh, oh, why don't you think about going to, to uh, Madison, Wisconsin? There's a good physical chemistry department there, because I'm in a physical chemistry department. Mm -hmm. Life. And uh, you might go there. And the other possibility was, I think it was Edsel's laboratory in uh, New York. And, 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 and they said, well, that's a bit of a machine place. In other words, you'll get a task and there'll be a, 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 a many, many other postdocs and you won't be able to do what you like. What did you set about studying there? Well, I was a physical chemist, and and I began to uh, when I got got there, I I found they'd been having trouble with a protein that I'd worked with when I was a graduate student. They had crystallized this pro. They they had no not crystallized. They'd prepared this protein high concentration of a protein called beta lactoglobulin, which I did use in my my own studies. And it was an oil, oily substance, and they hadn't been able to crystallize it. And I uh, knew a little bit about crystallization, so I, I just took the, be the beaker in which the oil was and scraped the side with a glass rod. And that makes little tiny flakes of glass that are flat, and they act as a, as a seed, and it crystallized. So I made my uh, reputation by crystallizing their beta lactoglobulin and then I began to study beta lactoglobulin in different ways of, that they were doing in that laboratory in Wisconsin. And one of them was w with the ultracentrifuge and I didn't much care for that but I did some work with it um, looking at lactoglobulin and they had an electrophoresis apparatus which is very complicated. It, Tizalis electrophoresis, it was called, and I did some studies with that, and, and I did studies with solubility and so on. And I accumulated a rather nice set of data, that completely unimportant data, and um, uh, eventually published that. But so I just sort of, in a sense, messed around, if you like. I, I, my work was careful and, and reproducible, and I did get to publish it, but it wasn't not 
uh, they had no importance about it at all. Uh, I mean, my, my thesis was never quoted by anybody for scientific reasons, and my postdoc work well, I published, as I said, but maybe it got four citations or something like that. Nothing to do with anything significant, so it was quite unimportant work, but I learned to do good science. So at this point in time, were you thinking that academic life was going to be for you? Oh yes, I was. I, I, I mean, I didn't ever think of anything else. I think I just thought of that. So, and I, and, and I got, fell in love with a, uh, an American girl and, uh, and, and got engaged to her. And uh, she didn't want to go back to to. She didn't want to go to England. And so I, I got a job in Canada, and uh, with the idea that she would join me there, which she did later. Um, and um, so my, I, I, in a sense, moved to Canada, you might say, for biological reasons. <laughs> and, um, and you uh, set about looking out for precursors to insulin. Yes, that's right. The, the person who hired me was David A. Scott, uh, who had a job, and <clears throat> he was get, getting to the end of his career, but he said, <clears throat> You can work on anything you like, as long as it has something to do with insulin. And, and I read the literature a bit at that time, as well as I could. There was no uh, PubMed, no Google, or you had to do it laboriously by going th through the journal. And um, decided that maybe there might be a precursor for insulin, and I began to look for it. <laughs> I never did find it. How did this lead you to starch gel electrophoresis. Well, it led to it because I found that when I tried to study insulin by electrophoresis, in this case not the Tizalis electrophoresis, which was liquid solution, but on, uh, there was a method of doing it on filter paper, where you took a piece of filter paper and, and um, soaked it with buffer and then put the protein mixture at a certain place and, and then passed a current and separated then, of course, uh, as one would expect, uh, into the different components. But insulin stuck to the filter paper and it was very frustrating. And then I heard that people were using a new method that had been uh, invented by uh, uh, Conkel and Conkel and I don't remember the other person, but Conkel and Slater maybe. Uh, but they had been using a, a tray about this, about this long, this wide, and maybe about that deep, full of starch grains, uh, powder, and with buffer solution around them. And, and uh, the uh, proteins didn't stick to the starch grain, and also would migrate nicely. And proteins which would stick to filter paper would migrate beautifully in this system. The only problem was, in order to find out where the protein was, you had to cut the block of starch, moist starch grain into 50 slices and do a protein determination on every slice. So imagine 50 protein determinations for one electrophoresis run. And I didn't even have anybody who helped me with the, my glassware. I did my own dishwashing, everything in the lab. I didn't have a technician. And then I remembered the childhood uh, uh, incident that, as I say, I was helping, um, but I think it would better be in quotation marks, helping my mother do the laundry. And, and she would take starch powder and cook it up with water, and it would make a gooey liquid, which then she would smear on my father's shirt collars when she was doing the laundry, and then ironed a stiff collar. But when tidying up, I evidently had noticed that it made a, it set into a jelly. And I thought, well, if I get the starch powder to which insulin doesn't stick, or probably will not stick, and cook it up into a gel, I can make a gel, and then I can stain the gel instead of cutting it. And I went back to the lab. This was a, a Saturday, I remember. And, and I went back to the lab, found some starch in somebody's storeroom, chemical storeroom, cooked it up, it made a gel, maybe it took a rather high concentration, 15% of, uh, of starch to make a gel, but the insulin moved beautifully, it didn't stick. And so I'd invented then starch electrophoresis, starch gel electrophoresis. 
but there was a really a rather fortunate accident in a sense that unknown to me the properties of the starch were so, well let me try this again that but the starch would not gel unless it was at a high concentration so about 15 percent so unknown to me that when you have a high concentration of a gel then molecules will separate now by size as well as by charge or put it that way always size was important but it became more important in a gel so you had a new dimension to the electrophoresis separation by size and that proved to be extremely powerful and that was what we call civic molecular sieving electrophoresis and very quickly people who read about my work didn't like starch and they made polyacrylamide so within oh I think a year or something like that people also began to use polyacrylamide as a as a gel but it was also your idea to take horizontal and turn it vertical oh yeah well I was having trouble with getting the sample uh, neatly into the gel because if you imagine you've got a protein solution in a slit here and the protein solution move the protein moves then you've got no protein in here and you've got protein here and it slides us down to the bottom and and so the gel comes out with a funny migration but if you turn it vertically you don't have that problem so yes I I did invent vertical electrophoresis. And during this time was when you became a molecular geneticist as well. Yes, yes, yes uh, well, because that also happened uh, all, uh, all uh, around that same sort of time. Because um, I, uh, w getting ready to publish my starch gel electrophoresis, I'd been running samples from myself, my own serum, and, and two of my men friends, a, bo a graduate student friend, uh, George uh, Connell and Gordon Dixon. And so I'd been running these, our samples a lot, and I was ready to publish. And I had a pattern that I knew was uh, fairly constant. There were differences, but it was mainly the same thing. And then I ran a sample from BW and uh, BW's pattern was very very different there were many many extra bands and, and, and BW they, was Beth Ward uh, yes? yes exactly well, Beth Wade, Wade. And, and, yes and she, it was a woman and so I, and I, I, and I thought I'd found a, a, a way of telling men from women a new way. And so I called the one pattern the M pattern, the other F pattern. And then for several days, I could only do two a day. I would do a man and woman. And for four or five days, it always fit. And then next day, psh, wrong way around, the man had changed into a woman. <laughs> that, we teased him anyway. How did you then figure out that what you were actually looking at was the separation of haptoglobin and serum oh, hemoglobin yes. oh, well, proteins? I, I knew from uh, just a simple observation that if the sample of blood that I had had hemoglobin in it, I, I would get a different pattern from the pattern I had when the sample was uh, free from any hemolysis. And, uh, and, and I recognized that the differences that I was seeing, the bands that I was seeing, bound to hemoglobin so they were they were it was a hemoglobin binding protein which differed in these samples and so but i didn't know haptoglobin i didn't know about haptoglobin and then i had a um a, a letter or a note or something of that sort i don't remember exactly how it was communicated but uh, 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 one of the laurels i don't remember whether it was i think it was the the the, the the female component of the Laurel family, uh, who said, you know, Oliver, the protein you're looking at, the hemoglobin binding protein, is probably haptoglobin that has already been described by a person called Max Ferdinand Jail. Um, and I, uh, I realized that that was indeed true, that uh, he had already described um, uh, a hemoglobin binding protein in plasma serum uh, and uh, he'd even recognized that there were differences in the in this protein but he hadn't realized there were genetic differences so where along this path did you end up back in Wisconsin thinking about 
homologous recombination. Oh, well, that, that's also quite a long story because uh, when I, I did get married eventually to the, the uh, person from Wisconsin, Lois Kitze, K-I-T-Z-E, and uh, we went, and she wasn't very happy in Toronto and wanted to go back to the States. And by then I'd done the genetic work with haptoglobin, so I had become, a, as it were, a molecular geneticist, and I didn't have any difficulty getting a job in um, in uh, Wisconsin, so I went to back to Wisconsin, but now in the genetics and medical genetics department, not in chemistry at all, and so I made the transition and become a geneticist, and working with that for a long time, and, and, and then, you know, science moved on, and it, uh, it became possible to sequence proteins, that was new, and then moving on lo uh, more still, then you could isolate DNA, you could clone genes, and we clone DNA and we learn to sequence DNA so uh, so my lab sequenced the second human gene to be cloned and uh, so I knew about uh, hemoglobin genes and because it was a hemoglobin gene we cloned and uh, and uh, so we had in a sense in our hands we had a test tube with good DNA in it. We had the globin gene, normal globin gene here in the test tube. And out there are people who have sickle cell anemia. And, and I thought maybe I can use the, the good DNA to correct the mutation in sickle cell anemia. And, but I didn't know how to do it. And, um, and, and most people, I think, at that time thought it, was very, it would be very difficult. It had been possible in yeast Terry or Weaver had done some pretty good, uh, pretty nice work uh, in um, uh, in uh, uh, yeast, and had shown that you could get gene targeting in a sense in yeast. But the genome is more than a hundred times bigger human, and I think people thought it wouldn't be possible. And I don't know, um, but I was thinking about doing it. What I wanted to do was correct the gene in bone marrow cells. You see, if you bone marrow, you can get out from a person. You could maybe use homologous recombination to correct the sickle cell gene and put it back into the person, and they would have uh, hope of, of being uh, better off the, uh, with sickle cell anemia. But uh, and then uh, I was te I was doing work on other things that uh, wasn't going very well and uh, teaching at the same time and I t I came across an article um, April first I think it was 1982 or something like that uh, and this was uh, um, Michael Wigler I think uh, if I remember rightly um, anyway uh, they had used a rather complicated way to isolate a transforming gene, that's to say a gene that would make a cell grow abnormally. And it was a very complicated um, experiment and, and I wanted to teach it. And so I had to read this paper very many times because it was a very difficult paper. And I taught it uh, in my class and then I, <coughs> and it was, I used some tricks that were very pretty tricks. Uh, to isolate the transforming gene. And I thought I could use the same general, general type of method to show if gene targeting worked. And the way to explain this is that the, what uh, they did uh, was to have a piece of DNA, let me call it a, a blue piece of DNA. And the blue piece of DNA we can assay in, in, the test, in a Petri dish by, because it will allow a bacteriophage to grow. So we have a mutant bacteria, bacteriophage that can't grow, but if it picks up the blue piece of DNA, it can now grow. So they uh, did a, a way of, they have an assay for the blue piece of DNA. Now, what they want to find is cells that are growing abnormally. So they did some complicated experiments of joining the bluer DNA randomly to fragments in the, that they prepared from the transformed DNA. And then, they, and then they took this DNA and used it to transform other cells and then isolated the colonies and, 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 and learned to get the bacteriophages which were blue, we had the blue gene. So by doing this several rounds and repeating it and 
transforming, getting, they were able to isolate blue next to the transforming gene. And I thought I can use a blue next to the beta globin gene as an assay for um, gene targeting. So I wrote a, a page in my notebook, which I'm very proud of, in which I write out our aim was to uh, place DNA in the, uh, to develop an assay uh, for placing DNA in the correct place. And that was uh, a pretty important page in my notebooks. And, uh, and the method that I outlined there, in fact, worked. Uh, it took three years to make it work, but it did work eventually. So you note in your autobiography that during this time you were offered chairmanships for, of departments <laughs> of genetics and many opportunities to leave the bench to do more administrative work. So clearly you made the right decision to stay, but do you counsel the people who come and train with you to shun administrative work? No, to not, not at all. Uh, I think this is a personal choice. Uh, uh, as you say, I got the opportunity to be chairman actually of three departments of immunology, genetics and, and biochemistry, I think, in one year. And, and um, I just decided that that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to go on doing experiment. <coughs> and I realized that if you become a chairman, you sacrifice that ability. So in a way, uh, I think I made a selfish decision uh, of not becoming a chairperson. Uh, because, of, but to be a chairperson, you have to want to help people, and you sacrifice things, and often you sacrifice your ability to do work. But I don't think it's just that. Uh, although I, it isn't that choice. There's a different choice because uh, the choice happens to people who don't become chairpersons. Uh, they end up by not doing bench work anymore. They end up either writing grants or supervising a large number of students because they decide that that's the way they go. And it's quite rare to find a, a, a full professor who still works at the bench, let alone a full professor who's 90 years old and uh, still working at the bench. And yet you still have an R01 that's active through 2017. Oh, yes, it's a good R01. I got very high score. I was in the top 1%, so I got a very good R01. So clearly you're good at that too. Yeah. Now, going back a little bit to, to the research side, during this three-year period between when you wrote that notebook yeah. page for the assay for gene placement yeah. and when you got that blue bacteriophage <laughs> that showed that you actually had made it work, yeah. Those were some dark days. Maybe you had a student or two who left, but you strike me as being incredibly persistent. Well, I think I was persistent because I had uh, people helping me at the time. I had a graduate student who helped me, but she decided that it, it was too risky and, and quit. And, and, uh, and uh, then we had a time when we realized uh, that we had the possibility of contamination with a, a, a bacteria already me and people got very despondent about it and um, uh, and, and I, I was a bit despondent about it um, and then I went away with my flying friends and we went sailing and I came back and said I'm going to start again and so I started again and with and changed the methods and and uh, made it work so um, you do you have ups and downs there were definitely downs but you might say persistent, and keeping good notes because there was part of the assay that meant uh, getting a large number of bacteriophages which make little pinholes in a bacterial plate. And um, uh, th for some reason or other that I didn't understand, they got my plaques got smaller and smaller. So I had to hold up the. We're using big dishes, not little tiny petri dishes. Big dishes, hold it up to this evening sun. You might say to see them, and I. And I couldn't understand why it wasn't working anymore. And then I thought, well, go back and look at when it was working and what did you do different? And I went back there and I found a little tiny note in bottom right-hand corner of, of the page where it last worked saying I had uh, thought that the bacteria that I was using to grow the bacteriophages 
had been made on Friday and this was Monday, I think I'd better freshen them up. So the little note says freshen them up by diluting them and letting them grow. And so they went back into growth instead of being what we call a stationary phase. Uh, phase. And uh, uh, when they were growing exponentially, it turned out they made big plaques. So I went back to my bench and, and changed uh, the, uh, growing the bacteria to growing them freshly. It worked again. And all because of a little note in the corner of my notebook. Now, speaking of your persistency, your persistence was partly then what led to your work being recognized by the 2007 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Can you tell me a little bit about whether or not you think that changed you? Did it change your science? Did it change your approach? Did it change your ability to do different things? Uh, getting the Nobel Prize, did it change things? Well, I'm going to go back a little way and, and reverse that, that question and saying that Howard Temin, uh, when I was in Wisconsin, as a quite young man, got the uh, Nobel Prize uh, for his uh, work in reverse transcriptase. And I remember when he got the Nobel Prize going to him and saying, Howard, I hope it doesn't change your life too much. Uh, and that's what I felt when I got the Nobel Prize. But after all, anyway, it was 20 years after I'd done the work. I'm already getting pretty ancient by then anyway. And uh, uh, I didn't really want to change my life. So the answer is it didn't change my life very much. I think it made it harder for me to get grants, not easier, I, I think, but that's a purely psychological thing in, in the number of rejections I got uh, of grants. You moved to North Carolina with your scientific yeah. and life partner, Nobuya yes, Maeda. Right. Do you think the two of you have influenced each other's science? Or oh, complimented. Oh, complement is the is the best word. But influence certainly uh, in the fact that you can, uh, as you know, uh, a husband and wife relationship. Wives are not a, 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 a reluctant to criticize husbands, and uh, uh, maybe the reverse is true. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you can get a good critic and you can get a good helper and a supporter when things are difficult and uh, and, and a good. Uh, um, sounding bell, you might say, to see uh, am I on the right track. Uh, if you have a wife that, that is that with whom you can communicate and vice versa, because we both have worked together for a long time on completely different topics, but using similar techniques, so that our lab r runs as a whole, but we have quite separate grants and separate aims in what we want to do but we know what each other is doing and we can help each other. And that's a very, it's a happy relationship. Uh, we don't have children, so in a sense our science is our communication and our scientific uh, progeny, you might say, are uh, the, the equivalent of our children. Mm -hmm. Can you recall your first experiment? Uh, it was, I was given a circuit diagram of a, of a, of a, of a, heat, uh, of a controller for a water bath, to make a, um, a water bath controller that would control temperature. And so that my first, I think my, the first page in my notebook, if I remember rightly, is uh, a circuit diagram of this uh, water bath. And I was used to making radios and things like that. I've made them for a long time since I was a child, really. You know, 12 year old, 10 year old, whatever. I made a radio when I was, oh, I don't, when I was at high school. So then I would be maybe 12 or 13 or 11. And had it in my gas mask case instead of a gas mask. It was World War II and we had, children had to carry gas masks in a, my, I took my uh, uh, gas mask and put it on one side and put a radio in my, built a radio and had it in my gas mask case. Do you have a favorite book? Oh, I, a favorite book. I, I think I would rather say a favorite composer. Okay. Uh, and uh, that, that would be John Sebastian Bach. I, he's my favorite composer. And, Do you play? Uh, yeah, oh, I used to play the flute, uh, not very well, and I quit for some while ago. But um, I listened to Bach's music and I, I visited where he was uh, born last year. Musician, mechanic, writer, pilot, 
What do you think you would have chosen, or none of the above, if you could not have been a scientist and or inventor? Oh, oh I, said, I told you my love of Bach, Bach music. I said I would love to have been born Johann Sebastian Bach. I think he had a grand life. He had all sorts of problems. He got put in jail at one time because he was too obstinate about something or other. But uh, he, he, he would have been, that's a life I would have lived, lived, loved to have lived. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed hearing your stories. My enjoyment of being with you and then telling them. Thank, thank you. you.